I can talk now. Can you hear me? Aha, there we go. Good? All good. Awesome. How's the sound to you? How do I sound? Testing one, two, talking to you. Hey, that's great. Yep. Nice to see you. Very squeaky and weaselly. Yes. Yeah. Like shifty, kind of in a, in a tone <laughs> that would make make you uncomfortable. Yeah. Like I would like almost greasy. If, you, if I could go oh, that yeah. way, go far, go so far, maybe. <laughs> I would go with it. It's good. Okay, good. Very good. Oh, there's Matt. Hmm. I mean, you can see him first. Gus, I have priority uh, placement in this. It's important yeah, that, I see, that I see everybody first. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> before they have a chance. Hey, good morning. Hello, hello. Hey, how's it going? You guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Great. great. Um, when I logged on, it said it was doing updates. And then it just said oh, no. error code. And then, But then it let me sign on. So... That's great. I, don't know. <laughs> I guess I don't have the latest version, but uh, it worked out. That's all Good. the uh, vi viruses we were installing, like as it goes. And now, <laughs> as we talk, we're just <laughs> stealing, stealing your social security numbers and stuff. It's all good. Yeah, I'll just <laughs> save some time and text you guys my routing number, and we'll be yeah, fine. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. Yeah. Actually, that would save us all a lot of time. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, how are you? Yeah, cool. I'm good. It's nice to meet you guys. So how yeah, nice to how meet you do too. you how do you know? G he lives in our neighborhood, and we have mutual friends who have connected us recently because he's a creative and I think some people said that we would get along and he had good connections. Right. Yeah, yeah we talked to him, <laughs> what, two weeks ago? Two weeks ago? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, oh, oh. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. I don't even know how we know each other. How about that? That's how <laughs> con connected we are. <laughs> well, you two are like in the same world work-wise. Yes. I do advertising. Ish. Yeah, I do nice. advertising as well. We do when it was with Under Armour. We did work with Under Armour and uh, very cool. Uh, I left nice. UA in like 2018, but that's so it's been a while. But uh, yeah, what were you doing yeah. there? I was a copywriter. I was a I was an advertising copywriter for uh, forever, <laughs> really my whole sort of adult life. And then in 2018, I kind of retired from corporate America uh, just to do novel writing full time, and it's uh, it's been great. Good for you. How was that transition where you like, was it a, I feel good and comfortable, great doing this. This is going to be great. And I feel like this is the easiest <laughs> path for me. I feel like it can go one way or the other. Like a lot of writers I've talked to have done it, have been overwhelmed by the amount of time they have. And they found they don't do much, much more than they had before. Cause like a job sort of structures your life, you know, mm -hmm. but um, it was great for me. It's just been fantastic. Like I've written, it took me when I was writing or when I was working full time, it took me like seven years to write two novels. And since I left, I've written, I've published a novel every other year, you know? Wow. So it's just oh. been fantastic. So I just wake up every That's day awesome. and just, and just write. Yeah. It's, it's living the dream for sure. Awesome. So you've got a structure. You're the type who can find a certain amount of time or do the same thing every day. I do. It's, I mean, it's great. I, I, I think that I don't know what it is about me or my temperament that just allows me to do it, but I've always, I think the hardest part of writing is just the sitting and the, doing and just arriving at the keyboard you know and for whatever sure. reason i've always been good at the sitting part you know and so and just doing it and showing up at the computer and yeah i get the kids to school that's my responsibility mm -hmm. and you know come 8 30 9 ish i basically have until 3 30 ish or 4 ish depending on the day i'll try to get a workout in there somewhere maybe but for the most part it's just i'm working i'm i'm writing you know for that whole time and uh yeah it's 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 worked out great that's interesting as a as a discipline it sounds awesome from a uh you know sort of professional standpoint that sounds that sounds uh amazing it seems uh kind of different from a lot of the people could sort of their workflows and things a lot of people sort of get the inspiration and then they have to get up at three in the morning or something like that yeah i've always 
I have a little notebook and I email myself if I get struck by some random thing when I'm at my daughter's basketball game or something. But for the most part, unless I'm right at the end of something or really on a roll, I basically treat it kind of like a like a nine to five sort of job. You know, mm -hmm. I show up to work and I do the work and then I leave, you know, which is great. And I even maintain that during the pandemic when everything blurred between when we're working and when we're not working. And we all lived at work for like three years. Right. <laughs> and most, right. Some of us still do, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, but I do. I just compartmentalize my day. And then when I pick up the kids, just their activities overwhelm until about bedtime. So even if I wanted to write, they would be like, nope, you got to take me to lacrosse dad or dance or, you know, basketball or whatever. So yeah, yeah, the kids, the kids are now my structure. Yeah. Yeah. I have a 14 year old and a 12 year old that are doing trumpet and saxophone and basketball and track and soccer. So yeah, we're, yeah. I'm chasing I, as well. I mm -hmm. also have four, 14 and 12. That's my number two. Uh, oh, very cool. yeah, two girls. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a girl dad. It's great. Gotcha. I have a, uh, older, but my daughter is 14. My son is 12. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. I've got one at each nine and 11. Okay. Just behind you guys, but doing just as many activities. I was sitting outside of a dance studio last night working on uh, some editing. Yeah. It's, it's like, I, sometimes I look forward to it. Like right now I'm right at the end of a draft of my next novel. And so like I, like I alluded to before, some of that structure and nine to five gets thrown out the window when you're right at the end of something because you're very, the end is, ends are very exciting, you know? And sure. so I was at my daughter's basketball last night and I was out on this little random table that was set up sort of outside of the gym, just writing, you know? And, um, I could hear and they would come in occasionally and check on me, you know, but yeah, uh, yeah so I'm kind of in that stage, uh, the downhill run of uh, of novel writing right now. So it's it's an exciting time. Uh, that's cool. And yeah, it's great that you can take it anywhere with you, too, that you can be so flexible. So two points there. One, do you think you're so structured? Is it just in your nature or did it come from like the fast deadlines of Under Armour when you were already writing? Yeah, I think advertising in general, and I worked at under Armour for about the second half of my advertising run of about 19, 20 years. But the thing about advertising, and I think you guys both know this, is you have to produce something based on a deadline. It, it's, it has nothing to do with inspiration. It has nothing to do with how much you like the product or how engaged you are in the material. Uh, it's due on the 13th, therefore you must have something on the 13th, right? right. And I think that is... I've carried that sort of discipline, that sort of go to work mentality into writing, uh, into writing novels. And that was sort of an accident. I didn't really intend to do that. But it, I think it has it has served me well, um, because I'm often not inspired. You know, the middle of mm -hmm. novels is a particularly uninspiring time mm -hmm. in the process, because sure. it's just this vast wasteland of words, you know, and pages. Um, <laughs> yes. So but you got to go. I mean, no book right. has ever written itself. So you got to right. sit down and you got to get through it. So. Yeah, it's uh, a little bit like, you know, like you said, just the hardest part is starting, like just sitting mm -hmm. and going and it's just starting to go. But once you just start going, then hopefully, you know, the sort of process kind of leads you there. But uh, yeah. so do you do you outline first and go through and say, all right, here's where I want to be or here are the here are the beats or is it a I have a beginning and an end and now I got to figure out what's happening in the middle or, you know, kind of what's your structure in that way? Yeah, my career as a novelist, I, I have five published novels and I can break it down into into my non outlining period and my outlining period. Really? And my first two books, I did not outline, I had sort of a random note card system where I would pin up notes, note cards that represented sort of major plot events and plot points in a vague chronological order. Did you use yarn to maybe tie them together on a wall? <laughs> I did not. Like the 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 uh, I'm trying to catch a predator approach yes. to a, no. I did not. Uh, I never know what those that yarn means in those detective movies. <laughs> I don't know. But, it looks um, cool. It's all. It connected. does look. It does look very cool. It's all connected. But um, and so I did that for two my first two novels, and I had two young kids, and I was working in advertising, and so. Those things, those books took me forever to write because along with the kids and the full-time job, when you don't outline, you run blindly down alleys for months at a time. And sure. then it'll suddenly dawn on you that those months were sending you in the wrong direction. And there's right. a school of thought. There's a lot of people that don't outline and they speak passionately about not outlining because those blind alley runs of three months uh, were valuable in their own right. And that's probably fine. Sure. But if your goal is to write 
as many novels as you can in the 50 or 60 years you have left on earth, then outlining is probably the way to do it. You know, you're much more efficient in your thinking and you're much more clear in what's going. Because if you know kind of vaguely what's ahead, you're writing towards something specifically. And it, it makes you feel, particularly in that vast, vast wasteland of the middle that I was talking about, it gives you direction. Like if I was going to hop in my car right now, this analogy doesn't work as well now that we all have you know global positioning systems on us at all times. But if I was going to drive to California right now, I I know Just that it's, it. vague, yeah, it's vaguely west of here. I know that. <laughs> right. right. But I would probably glance at a map or something, right. you know, just be right. like, okay, well, maybe I'll take this particular highway, you know. And so that's um, sort of well, the analogy that I that I go with. It's a hell of a lot easier to break down that trip as going from, all right, from Baltimore to Kansas City and then Kansas City to Denver, you know, sort of in those chunks as opposed to just going, well, I'm going to just start this journey and we'll see where we go. Yeah, totally. Uh, when I worked at when I worked at Under Armour, our creative director uh, there, a guy named Brian, he used to, we would have these gigantic big projects, and they were always very daunting. And he would say, "How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, you right. know." And you don't write a novel three hundred pages at a time, you know. You yeah. one scene at a time. It's like today and the next couple of days, my job is to get my main characters through this argument and to their daughter's dance recital or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. that's what you're that's what you're trying that's what you're trying to do. And if you set yourself up with little goals and little benchmarks you it's surprising how fast the pages really do accumulate yeah that's um, very logical which is the opposite of most creative brains too mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good that you can fuse those two together well that's the idea of being a go, coming from an ad background sort of serves you in that way too I think I can remember. So I, I've been creative director for an ad agency as well and um, I remember you know having a guy come in and he's like well here are my 70 ideas and I'm like okay well here's the deal dude <laughs> Now you're doing this as a, as a job. I don't need 70 ideas. I need five great ideas. Okay. Yeah. So you know, whittle that down. It's not just putting out whatever you feel like. Now you're being asked to do this, you know, and I think it's that adding that sort of discipline layer on top that serves well. Yeah, that sounds like, so every time I finish a novel, you know, the novel's done and there's a period of, uh, you know, editing and all that. So a novel sort of lingers before it's done, done for quite a while, but you're sure. trying to get a new novel off the ground. And there's always that, and this this is straight out of advertising, there's that rule of three and you're pitching. You come up with three ideas that you like, and they always sound so harebrained. You know, you're like, uh, okay, there's a time machine and these characters don't like each other, but they're going to fall in love. And they're just, and your editor is always like, what? Now, wait, how do they know each other? You know, and you just sound like a complete moron. But um, out of those three completely stupid ideas, Every time I've done that, a novel has arisen. You know, huh. when we were pitching running shoe ideas, you know, you would show up with a bunch of harebrained ideas and eventually out of those harebrained ideas, just kind of allow yourself to to sound stupid and to chase down harebrained ideas. I think that's that's a big part of the process. I was going to say on that note, so I haven't gotten about sounding stupid. Yeah, I'm very good at that. I've been working on. on that, been crafting that um, <laughs> delicate process for, for 47 years. But uh, the so I, I haven't gotten all all the way through all together now. I read Charm City Rocks, which I loved, by the way, really fun. Thank you. It, it hits a lot. Hits a lot of notes. I'm music guy, sports guy, Baltimore guy. So hits. Yeah, there it's, you all, go. Checks all the boxes. You're my target um, audience for that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very good, and and it hit. But it's funny. So you have the writer in all, all together now, who is uh, you know sort of talking about the struggle of the pitch for that is that um has that happened to you have you has there has there ever been a point where you were like uh here's my idea and they were like um mm, well, that's not probably not gonna happen have you reached that i certainly have and okay. usually out of like i do believe in pitching three ideas uh, I like to have three like ideas that I feel like I feel good about all three of these and I could write these three novels right now I just need to be told which one you know are you um, usually leaning on one? Yes, always, without question. And so you kind of make that pitch just glow, you know, and the rest yeah. you kind of push aside. But um, I, I, there have been times when the three, like, well, okay, these two, absolutely not. But this one, there's something there. And then you go back and you just kind of spend some time just figuring out the good things that they said and measure the bad things. When I say they, usually my agent, gets the first look at these ideas and then uh, my editor Ann and I treat those two especially my editor 
kind of like the boss, you know, they're the creative director. They're the ones I'm mm -hmm. trying to get a, get a yes out of. And she's good at taking ideas and honing them. And one of the things that happens, and this is more specific, I think, to being a novelist than advertising, is when you publish several novels, those novels really do become kind of guardrails for you. And so I've written, I've published five novels that all kind of sit next to each other on the bookshelf, right? I mean, they're same themes. They're very contemporary. A lot of them are set here in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. If I showed up with the, okay, there's a time machine pitch, they'd be right. like, what are, you, what are you talking about? That does, that's not you, that's somebody else. And so you're starting to paint yourself into a little bit more of a corner, or at least that sounds more negative than I mean it to maybe just kind right. of blaze a trail and you have to kind of exist within that trail. You know, mm -hmm. I think, I think any writer who's published more than a book or two kind of has, has that apparatus, apparatus sort of built in front of them that they have to stay in. Do you feel comfortable there? Or are you constantly looking over the guardrails and seeing what else is out there? I think that I have ideas within those guardrails. I've written, I, I feel like I've drawn a fairly small circle around myself and I've written in that circle, like uh, the types of people I write about, the types of themes I write about. But occasionally I do get an idea and I'm like, oh man, that would be a great book written by someone else, you know? <laughs> and uh, I just sort of shove those aside because- it's Good to know your strengths and limits. You yeah. should do You should do a, a Richard Bachman, you know, Stephen yeah. King thing where you just write under a pseudonym <laughs> as something completely bizarre. Exactly. It would be it would be fun to do that just as sort of an experiment um, sometime. Uh, I think I'm just too much of an egomaniac, though. It's like I spent two years on this damn thing. I'm putting my name on this, you know, but um, <laughs> I could, the pseudonyms are so complicated, too. Like, what do you do about author photos? And I don't mm, imagine a book that does well, a, a pseudonym that really a book that does well. I just don't imagine how it stays a secret. I, I mean, it's, I mean, Nowadays, certainly not. Yeah. You know, I think maybe yeah. 70s, 80s, you could get away with that stuff, you know? You could. Yeah, I know. One Google Google search would be like, uh, yeah, uh, that's not you, you know, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Detectives are too quick now. So editing process, how long does that usually take you? And do you enjoy that? Because that's just chopping up everything that you've put your heart and soul into. <laughs> I do like it because I feel like, um, as I mentioned, I'm I'm toward toward the end of that first draft stage of the next book, and which is just pulling words out of thin air and just the struggle, you know, to a thousand words a day is just monumental achievement. And is that what you aim for? That's what kind of what I aim for uh, generally. And I'm kind of in a more downhill stage right now, so it's more like two thousand words a day now because it's mm -hmm. just kind of an exciting time. But a thousand words a day is typically like a good day, and that might be four or five ish pages, depending on how much is dialogue and all that. Yeah, but editing it's good because you just you get to break all that apart and you get to cut out the stuff that doesn't is unnecessary. And you can see when you're looking, you know, take a couple of weeks off and then read that first draft. You can see what is bubbling up, you know, where you can feel the heat rising off the page. It's like, this is what I need to be focusing more on and not this. And plus, you know, anytime you're creating people that don't exist, you know, you get to know them as you go. And so sure. your char character on page 45 might behave in a certain way that they didn't on, you know, page 270. And so you have to go back and it's like retrofit the personality that you have have slowly built for them and apply that back to when they were introduced or, you know, that kind of thing. So sure. um, I really, I really enjoy that. Dropping little breadcrumbs throughout that kind of, you know, add up to the person that you've developed. Yeah, totally. I mean, maybe this guy, I envisioned him on page, you know, at the beginning is sort of shy and he becomes progressively more you know, less shy, more bombastic, more outspoken. And maybe mm -hmm. that's a more interesting version of him. So it's like, I go back and be like, okay, well, he was shy early. But now that's really not a very interesting uh, iteration of this person. He should be a more bombastic. He should say more. That's more interesting. And then you go create that uh, from page one. Sure. So when I write, I'm story first. So like I usually chase an idea, whereas you seem to be pretty good at dramatic character development. That was just never my forte, my space, because I always like to have these bigger, you know, plot points and things that are going on to really put pressure on the characters. Time machines and such. Time machines time and machines. such. Yep. <laughs> Vampires, time machine. Yes. Right. Did you kind of fall into that? What drives you there? It's typically an idea first, like a situation first, like you said. I mean, the story first and then fitting characters into that and uh -huh. it takes it does take a lot of work and that character development and like the that side of writing 
doesn't come easily to me. That's the thing I have to really work on the most. And that is editing. That's just rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. You know, because yeah, I sure. think that if you look at a first draft, all the characters sort of sound the same in dialogue. And mm -hmm. when I say they sound the same, they basically sound like me, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, that's really what I was getting at. How do you write? Because you seem to be pretty good at it, writing a diverse set of characters that aren't multiple versions of you. Right. <laughs> So how they're do you all, approach Yeah, they're that? all me. I think of me just wearing wigs, <laughs> yeah. just like seven right. or eight versions of me. <laughs> so I think it's important to just, when you're looking at draft, because I guess, you know, back in the olden days, like Hemingway pounding something out on a typewriter, a draft was a very specific thing. It's like, mm -hmm. I've wrote, I've written four drafts of this, but as a, you know, word pro modern word processing writer, you're kind of coming in and out of something. You might have like a third formal draft of a book. But sure. you've rewritten one scene 30 times or you've messed with it a bunch of times. So uh, it's hard to say what a draft really is anymore. But I, after I have, you know, the book, a beginning, middle and end, mm -hmm. I tend to go back through it again, very specifically through each character's lens. It's like, mm. I'm going to look at this viewing of this book through the female lead. Everything is about her. Once you know them and they're better developed. Exactly. Once you know them and they're better developed. And, uh, you know, with a book like my my fourth novel altogether now, there were four leads. And so that was that was a lot of work. There's two yeah. leads in this one, the one I'm writing now. My first two books were first person male narrators. So that was easier. You know, mm -hmm. it's just uh, it's all through this guy's lens. Right. Yeah. So on that, I, I will say so. Typically, I tend to lean as far as if I'm choosing to read like sci-fi horror or something like that that is pushing beyond. So honestly, reading Charm City Rocks is a little outside of my sort of lane. But I, I agree with Aaron that the people come off very, you know, very relatable to me, obviously, like we talked about earlier, sort of the target genuine. demo there. Yeah, like genuine. And I'm just wondering what led you to that sort of style or, or like, I would say it's almost like reading a romantic comedy kind of aspect. Um, was that what you gravitated towards or did, are there other things or where, how'd you land, land on that kind of as your core? So I feel like Charm City Rocks really does represent me as a writer. And I think my other books, if you were to, you know, start with my first novel and just kind of read them straight through, you would, you would see that, that vibe. The first person novels and the third person novels, they're all very close in there and very likable characters and generally speaking i believe in the villainless novel i've never written like a classic villain there's no hans gruber in any of my <laughs> books right and i think this idea that i've sort of accidentally created over the years is that if you present a story and everybody is likable everybody basically likes each other and the reader can like all of them that's going to be kind of a compelling reading experience and so that's basically what I've done, and you know, never say never, maybe I'll, mm -hmm. my next book will have a complete monster in it, you know, but right. that isn't really keeps kind it... of my aesthetic, you know. Yeah, lighter and breezier, you know, not having a traditional antagonist, but trying to find the conflict elsewhere, I, I guess, in tension between, you know, the wants and needs of the characters. Exactly. And I, I think that trying to create emotional experiences for the reader is something I'm always trying to do. It's like, Mm -hmm. There, like a, a book, and whether you're reading it or writing it, is an intellectual exercise, but it's also an emotional exercise, right? You need both yeah. of those things. And I think we've all read novels before or seen movies before that were just too intellectual. Like they just they kept you at a distance. You were not emotionally engaged, although they were written with talent and insight and all that. I I, I tend to try to hit him in the heart and not the head, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so if if a reader's having an emotional experience with one of my books, I feel like I feel like I've succeeded. I, I totally get that. When I was younger, I think I would have gone the other direction, you know, try to be as heady as possible. But now that I'm older and dumber and slower, and I just want <laughs> <laughs> more approachable, you know, commercial types of works. Yeah, exactly. I think as I've gotten older, too, I've started to I, maybe it's having kids, you know, maybe you two have experienced this as well. But I, I feel like some of the edges have really dulled in me. Mm -hmm. Like I, sure. if you look at my first two books, they're edgier. Uh, there was more swearing. Yeah. The characters were I still all generally likable, but not as easily likable, I don't think. Um, yeah. And then we all have with, like an axe to grind when we're younger. You know? Yeah, exactly. I think we're they're a little angrier. They're, yeah, they're all carrying around their axes, I think, much more than in, 
you know, books three through five and now six. I think um, I think I'm a much more edgeless writer now than I was back then, for better or worse. You know, I, I think it's say, just, I, does that feel good? I mean, is that like well, it's just, or it is what it is. You know, it's just kind of where you gravitate and you feel good about. It. I think it is what it is. You know, I, I I just you know you sit down and you type, and those are the words that come out. And my third my third book. I think represents the real shift. So I spent a lot of time on it because I was still, it was the last book that I was working and writing at the same time. And the end of that book ends in a very shocking sort of vi accidentally violent way. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a shock to the system. And it's a much different ending than it ended up getting published. And I was interested in a sort of American beauty idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was with the third book, I was really inspired by American Beauty, where for two hours or so, you're laughing. It's like a situational, almost domestic comedy. And then in the yeah. last 10 minutes, Kevin Spacey gets his brains blown out, right? Right. Spoiler alert for spoiler all those alert. Yeah. If you haven't seen it. <laughs> that's right. Asterisk spoiler alert. But yeah, um, if you haven't seen it, you deserve to hear that. <laughs> that's right. No kidding. 25 years later. But yeah. uh, and so I feel like I was trying to accomplish that. I, I put my characters in a situation. And I wanted them to have real consequences for their behavior. And Everybody on my team, you know, the agent, editor, we're all like, absolutely not. This isn't you. This is not you. You're a sentimental, positive, breezy writer. You should do that. And then I obviously ended up rewriting the ending, and it's a much more me ending, I think. And that, and huh. since then, I feel like I've been much the ed the edgeless writer before that I was talking about. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. You know? No, I don't think that is a negative way. Everyone has their own style. Uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be. So sharp, rough, I guess. Yeah. Did you know that abrupt ending going into it? Or did you come upon it midway through? Uh, I did. I was writing toward it. And I had to peel those because, you know, there there's a certain energy that if you like, if you for the American Beauty example, if you look back mm -hmm. through American Beauty, there are little things throughout that book that are leading toward darkness. Yeah, sure. Starting with Kevin Spacey. You know. Yeah, exactly. Starting in moment one, <laughs> casting, but, uh, casting. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> well, there is there's a certain tension that sort of perv you know that pervades through the whole thing, and so you kind of yeah. if you're going to go that route, you sort of are laying a little bit of that throughout. Exactly, and so I had to go back and peel some of that out, uh, which was you know part of the editing process, and uh, I was you know I was I was capable and and happy to do it because it it it, it made a better book, I think for sure. Nice. Uh, it reminds me a little of uh, what's that Jonathan Franzen book? Uh, corrections? No, the one he wrote after the corrections. Freedom? Yes. Yeah. Lots of characters, you know, moving through life, lots of musical cues. And, you know, they all add up to that big, abrupt, violent ending that pulls people back together. That's right. I I don't really look at my Amazon reviews very often because I just don't think it's a healthy thing to do. But after <laughs> my second book, I was scanning them once and somebody yeah. called me a shittier Jonathan Franzen. So I was, I was Ooh. like, Oh, all right. I'll take that. Hey. Yeah, I'll take that yeah. any day of the week. You know, why not? Right. Um, you should put that on your next right. cover. That right. should be my blurb. A shittier Jonathan Franzen. <laughs> <laughs> I'd buy that book. Are you kidding? Yeah, sure. So where do you start? I mean, were you always writing or did you just have this epiphany one day? Like what let you down this road? I was always writing. I was that kid when I was a little kid. I was writing stories in pencil and reading them to my parents. You mentioned Richard Bachman earlier. I was a huge Stephen King fan when I was little, uh, like weirdly little, like third, like fourth, fifth grade. You and Aaron, twisted people, <laughs> just twisted people from the start. Yeah. I read um, Pet Cemetery as my first book, and my mom was a big reader and still is a big reader. And so I was always fascinated by the books on the shelf. And I pulled Pet Cemetery out there, and the, you know, I was like, "Oh, what's a cat?" And this is interesting. And I was should be a safe place to start. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was excited by it. I was like, "Wow, <laughs> this is cool and interesting and dangerous." And so I read um, Stephen King. Got me excited about writing and wanting to be a writer and reading first and foremost because I was like, "This is cool." The stuff I was being assigned mm -hmm. in school wasn't awesome and dangerous, and sure. uh, you know, uh, and so I discovered discovered him, and I think that's probably. Not my biggest creative influence because I don't write horror novels and all that, but just mm -hmm. my biggest influence, the, the person that got me to want to be a writer definitely was Stephen King. But I understood enough about the world and I was always smart enough to know even back then that nobody's going to pay you for trying to be a writer or for wanting <laughs> to be a writer. And yes. 
you know, and my dad uh, is a classic businessman. You know, he's uh, like a fine, you know, and he worked throughout his career with advertising agencies. He wasn't in advertising, but his, part of his job was to kind of be the liaison, you know, between his company and ad agencies. Mm-hmm. And he told me how ad agencies were structured. He's like, there's a, a, a person called a copywriter and they write and they get paid to write. That's their career. You should do that and mm-hmm. write novels uh, on nights and weekends, you know? And he said this to me when I was maybe a senior in high school. That's and usually awesome. when you're 18 years old and your dad tells you something, you're like, shut up, dad, you don't know me, you know? Um, but I was like, oh, wait, old man. <laughs> that's right. But yes. I was like, dad, that you're a genius. I'm, I'm going to do exactly that. And so I showed up at the University of Nebraska as an 18 year old, as an advertising major and an English double minor. And it's like, I'm going to, you know, it was like Happy Gilmore who says, I'm a hockey player, but I'm playing golf today. It's like, <laughs> right. You know, I'm, a, I'm an advertising guy, uh, but or I'm a novelist, but I'm an advertising guy today, you know. Right. Um, and so I, I got a career in advertising and that afforded me the ability to have an apartment and buy groceries and have a job in a 401k. But um, I, I wrote it on nights and weekends. And that's um, awesome. Yeah. So that was so right out of the gates. That's the only it's the only thing I've ever really wanted to do. I had to do a lot of other things in support of that, you know, sure. but that was the only thing I've ever really chose, you know, chosen, wanted to do. I'm so jealous of anyone who knows what they want to do so early on outside of like a doctor or a lawyer or something really specific like that. So when did you, I don't want to say hit it big. When did you uh, publish your first novel? Um, I sold that book in 2009 or 10 that came out in 2011. So it's been a while okay. and I was, I was mm. working at Under Armour. And I remember the day that my agent called me and I was in my cube and I had to like step away, you know, and have like a moment <laughs> in the hallway. Yeah, um, it awesome. was great. It was, fan- it was, it was fantastic. And I had written, I had written a novel in grad school while I was before Under Armour in a previous job. I was living in the, in the Washington DC area and going to, I got my MFA at George Mason okay. University over in Virginia. And I wrote a graduate, my graduate thesis was a novel. Hmm. And uh, it never got published, but it did get me. It landed me an, an agent, which was wonderful. And Jessica, mm-hmm. my agent, is is my agent to this day. We've been together for a long time. That, that was going to be my next question: How'd you get an agent before you sold anything? Yeah, before I sold anything, and that's kind of how you have to do it. And you, you know, it, it's a little antiquated now because everything is you know digital and email mm-hmm. and all that. But back in the you know the days of days of your fifteen sixteen years ago. <laughs> um, you know, you would print out uh, a query letter, which is basically like a cover letter you would send with a resume, you know, for like a real job mm-hmm. and uh, sample pages. And you would say, my name is you know Matthew Norman. I've written this book. I think if you like Nick Hornby and Jonathan Tropper, you're going to like this book. Uh, take a look and let me know what you think. And, you know, she wrote back and I, I she had had a relationship with pr- professors of mine. So she had a connection okay. with George Mason. So mm-hmm. I did it was a little bit of a little bit of sort of professional nepotism there and kind of got mm-hmm. me in the door. Um, hey, use what you can. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, but she's like, yeah, send me the whole book. And then I sent her the whole book and she's like, I love it. You're, I want to represent you. And wow. um, so she was my agent and we failed. She, you know, we didn't sell that book, mm-hmm. but then my, my, that was the first novel length manuscript I had written. And then the, the second one that I wrote was my first published novel and she sold that, sold that, uh, which was, uh, which was the beginning of it all. And it was a wonderful experience. That's wild. Did that original novel turn into anything or is it still sitting there or, and maybe coming back? It is somewhere in the stacks of the library of George Mason university. I know that much. <laughs> um, it is, I borrowed from it for a couple of things with the novel domestic violets. Yeah. They ended up getting published. So I, I did borrow from it a little, so because of that, that manuscript, it lives in the stacks of George Mason University somewhere. I know that much. But you can yeah. put it with like a box set. It's like the demo tapes of that's right. of domestic <laughs> violence right there. That's, it's like, yeah. 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 Take a, yeah. Taking a cue from the music industry would be interesting. Like I thought about that before, not maybe me specifically, but like, you know, classic books. Like what if somebody just offered a first draft up and was like, check yeah. this out, everybody, you know. That right. would be really cool. You know, I have a ton of those box sets of my favorite albums of all time. Oh, definitely. Mm-hmm. You know, the like weird bedroom yeah. recordings of stuff. That's totally like, like yeah. you two working through the beginning ideas of Octune Baby. I have, I love that. I listen to it all the time. Yeah. But um, writers just don't do that for whatever. The publishing industry just doesn't do that. It would be, I don't know, an interesting experiment. Yeah. I should, yeah. Uh, yeah, we did uh, 
uh, interview with uh, Paul Tremblay, but his book, Paul Bear's Club, actually has, and it's it's a mechanic through it, but marginalia in the book itself, too, which is really cool, too. So, like, you could do something like that. I think that would be really cool to see the orig- original drafts of something where an editor has come through and struck this and said, this is great or not good or whatever. Yeah, like, like, that could be cool. Like, in the days of red penning, something I think might be gone because Anne does things digitally, but it still exists. I mean, it's still her notes in a yeah. little, you know, bubble over a paragraph a lot of her i always joke with Anne. a lot of times she has a very specific feedback but a lot of times she'll just basically what she's saying is could you in this section be more talented could you be a better <laughs> novelist <laughs> in this whole part of the i'm like okay i see what you're saying uh, what i'd like to I, do here is try if you try, try <laughs> here that'd be just awesome. shoot for just shoot for a <laughs> level of competence that you have yet to reach that would be yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah, and that's moving all. on. Right. <laughs> so where did you grow up? Where Where are you from originally? I'm from the Midwest. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I was wondering uh, if you just were drawn there for the, the writing or yeah, so I grew up at the University of Nebraska. Grew up in Omaha, um, went to University of Nebraska, which is in Lincoln, about 45 minutes away from Omaha. And I got a job in a, at a little ad agency in Omaha after college. And I was there for a couple of years. And I knew that I wanted just a bigger city, you know, a bigger marketplace. And I wanted to go to grad school and I had Mm -hmm. some friends and family in the DC area. And so I basically just one day was like, I'm out, I'm out of Nebraska. I loaded up my car Mm -hmm. and just never, never, never looked back. And I've been on the East coast ever since, which, uh, which I I love. I love it out here. That's great. Did you not like the Midwest in general, or did you not like it just because it was too small and you want to be closer to, uh, I guess the publishing industry or bigger opportunities? Probably. The the latter, for sure. I mean, I have nothing bad to say about Nebraska. I, I was just at that sort of stage of my life, call it 22 or 23. You know, a mm-hmm. lot of people in the Midwest get married younger than they do out here on the East Coast, right? right. And so I went, to, I went to a lot of weddings when I was 22 years old, right? Hmm. And I wasn't with someone, right? I was free as a bird. I had a job that, you know, it, it was fine, but it wasn't like this thing that I that right. I held on a pedestal. I was I was as free as I was ever going to be again as an adult, right? Yeah. And so I just I just took off. I'm like, let's go somewhere. And I can always come back, you know, is no one's mm-hmm. they're not gonna they're not gonna put up a wall at the border of Nebraska, you know. Um <laughs> and so uh, but I never did they, they actually might be they but, might that's a good point. It's a, it's a pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty <laughs> red state. It's a different it's a different yeah. age now but I yeah, don't that, want to take actually I don't want to take this dark. But the Midwest <laughs> is pretty red. But um <laughs> Yeah, but uh, and I think that I think being Midwestern, you're growing up in the Midwest. I think it probably set certain parts of my personality are probably very Midwestern. And when I say that I'm from Nebraska, mm-hmm. a lot of people aren't surprised by that. I think just the cadence of my voice and the way I talk is feels Midwestern. Mm-hmm. But when I moved out east, I experienced a level of just general neuroses and anxiety with people mm. out here. <laughs> I felt a little more at home. Like I experienced a level of anxiety and just general trepidation with people out on the East coast that I related to. And it made me feel in retrospect, like maybe I wasn't quite at home in the Midwest because Mm. (laughs) they were all just living their lives and getting married. And I was in emotional mess all the time. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, (laughs) They didn't have a lot of therapists out there. (laughs) You're like Dorothy, you know, where you're like, there must be something else out there. (laughs) I just don't feel (laughs) satisfaction here. I want to find troubled people like myself. Well, welcome to the East Coast, where everybody's yes. about. You know, so, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> I went to college uh, in the South, and I remember feeling the same thing. At the end of it, I was just an anxious, like batty mess. I was like, I, I need uh, movement. You know, right. right. The first day I got down there, I remember walking to the registrar's office and going to check in and do something. And I was talking to her just like this. The woman goes, "Hun, you got to slow down." <laughs> Like no one has ever told me that in my life before. <laughs> yeah. Out here everybody's, you know, talking faster and in some sort of a hurry and kind of mad at a few people. And my right. oh, uh, yeah. my wife is from New York. She's a New Yorker, not New York City, uh-huh. uh, but she's from like upstate New York. And she is a New Yorker. And you can particularly tell when we're driving and she's driving. And it's mm. like, are we in a competition with all of these other drivers? Every like, single you, other car on the road. What is wrong? So I become very Midwestern behind the wheel of a car, and she becomes a New York City taxi driver behind the wheel of a car. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's funny. The regional you know, nature versus nurture really does uh, show up from time to time. Sure. So 
uh, your characters, are you pulling more from your Midwestern roots or your neurotic East Coast sensibilities? But that's a good question. I I would love somebody who is mm. maybe has like an English background or something to answer that question. Who has read all my books? I think that one of the one of the things that I've maybe struggled with isn't isn't the right word, but I've challenged my challenge to write people who are from the East Coast. You know, like I've had characters, and you know, this character I'm writing now, both both of the male and female lead in this book I'm writing right now are born and raised in Baltimore, which mm-hmm. I'm not. You know, and I and I think um, you know that's been interesting, and I've had to just observe a lot, you know, observe people and observe my friends that I've met, you know, who are born and raised here. And it's been, it's been fun to just sort of look outside of myself, you know, like my early books about a tall Caucasian Midwestern you know, man, you know, it's like, right. well, geez, where'd you come up with that guy? You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. How tall are you, by the way? You describe yourself as six foot two. Hmm. Um, when I'm not slouching. It's a solid hype. Uh, six, three. Six three when I'm wearing Air Jordans, so it's, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm slightly unnecessarily tall. My brother's very tall; he's like six five. Gotcha. Oh, yeah, that's kind of just above the line. I think six to six two is where I always wanted to be. You never just know. Did, still working on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One still day. reaching. I'm still reaching. <laughs> uh, but six two, I can go to stores and buy clothes. Like my brother has to order clothes. You know. Yep. Oh uh, God, that would be a pain. That yep. would be yeah. But I just uh, my so I, I'm like five ten. My brother's. Uh, a little bit taller than I'm, maybe five eleven. Um, his wife is six foot, um, and their son is six foot nine. Holy cow! He uh, he went to James Madison to play basketball, and they had to be like, "Hey, you can you get say. a different bed for it?" And they were like, "Yeah, no problem. Gotcha. No problem at all. Got it." You know, and he's got this enormous twin size bed on campus, you know, and all that. <laughs> Outrageous. My younger daughter plays basketball, and she's in um, some travel teams. And you meet some very tall people at those tournaments. Oh, and yeah. uh, one of one of her teammates' dad is six ten. He used to play Ooh. basketball. Um, he played basketball at uh, in D.C. One of the colleges in D.C. And um, her mom is, is six feet tall. She also played college basketball. Oh wow! And so <laughs> this girl, my my um, my daughter's teammate, is really really tall, and she's twelve years old. So she hasn't completely. Right, you know, harness the power of that height yet. So there's a lot of sort of giraffe like behavior happening out there. A lot of limbs. Yeah, exactly. A lot of limbs. Uh, (laughs) But when she harnesses that, she's going to be unstoppable. I mean, she's already starting to take the turn. So, uh, yeah. That's awesome. My daughter's a gymnast. So I always feel tall when I go to (laughs) meet. It's a good medium ground. Yeah. Yeah. I will say Aaron's daughter is very, very, like a very good gymnast, too. Like a spider monkey. Nice. Yeah, I, great. I remember. I remember her doing the climbing wall at like age six. Yeah, there was a a while where I was going to a personal trainer with a buddy of mine, and we would come back just absolutely exhausted. And you know, she'd say, "What did you do today?" And I was like, "Oh, we had to do you know these wall sits and these holding these balls and these slams and all this stuff." And she's like, "Oh, we had to do that in conditioning today, but we had to do it twice as long." You know. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like, our, oh. and that was our warm up, and then we go. For yeah. That. <laughs> right. Stop it, you and your youth. Stop yeah, it. Seriously. Exactly. They only knew. So kind of on that Under Armour note, I was curious as to what was that point that you felt comfortable taking the leap saying goodbye to the corporate world? I'm going to sit by myself and write all day. So it was always kind of the the goal and, you know, to write full time. And Under mm-hmm. Armour became because I had just sort of jobs and I always feel like this is a job. I really want to be a writer. Under Armour yeah. sort of crossed that line because it was a big job. And it was fun. And I met a lot of famous athletes. And it was really cool, right? Who was the worst one you met? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. <laughs> he, oh, you froze. Conveniently as frozen. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyers have edited out Matt, Nor- Matt Norman here. Can you imagine? Yeah, that's a perfect time to freeze. Um, <laughs> no, um, I will say one of the nicest days of my adult life i spent the day basically with justin verlander oh really uh-huh. just lovely lovely he was wanted to chat about sports and baseball in baltimore just a great guy i really enjoyed that but um so under armor was a really cool job but what i started to realize a couple of whenever you make a big life decision there's a bunch of different things at play like our we had an au pair at the time because my wife and i were both working full time and she was about to go back to germany and that was sort of this moment of like, okay, do we get another au pair? Do we get another nanny? You know, whatever. So that was starting to happen. 
I was basically done with my third book and my agent was very confident that she was going to be able to sell it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I, I, I was starting to travel a lot for work and it was really Under Armour was really starting to cannibalize my novel writing time. And so mm -hmm. all of these three things were happening kind of at the same time. And my wife and I just sort of had a discussion and, you know, we were like, this is, this is the time to do it. You know, yeah. this is the time. And so I, I made, uh, I made the leap in 2018 out of corporate America. And, you know, it was, it, it was, you know, risky at the time, obviously, because you never know, but um, yeah, sure. it, it could not have worked out better. It was just, it was so great for me and for writing. And I get to be with the kids a lot more. Um, yeah. So it, it was, it was a good deal. So obviously you don't have the same benefits, but I mean, are you close to matching what you were bringing in from Under Armour? Uh, it depends on the year. Uh, mm -hmm. Writing is a very weird business financially where you are given, you'll be given a big sort of chunk of money, but then no money for like seven or eight months or <laughs> a year. You know what I'm saying? And so it's yes. difficult to set a budget around, even if stuff's going great, yeah. it's difficult to kind of set a budget around writing money. Uh -huh. um, High end drug dealing is like that as well. Exactly. You so, know, uh, it ebbs like and flows, a, right? A score here and then, yeah, it kind yeah, of pays so it out. <laughs> it has, it, it, it does have its moments and sometimes I've done well and sometimes there've been dry spells where it's like, well, Kate, my wife, I'm glad you've got a real job because I certainly don't. You know, <laughs> right. <that's>, right. <laughs> and on a super lame level, but you need benefits and stuff like that too. That's awful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Somebody's got to take care of these teeth and these eyeballs, you know? Right. Yeah. You can injure yourself pretty bad writing. No. That's right. The carpal tunnel center Malone. <laughs> you could. <laughs> yes. Uh, mental health. Spent yeah. a lot of time there, I'm sure. <laughs> so you've got five books published right now, correct? Correct. Yes. Sixth is almost in the can. It is almost done with the first draft. So it'll be a, a good eight months or so of editing and all that. But it's in a good it's in a good place. Number six is in a good place for sure. But you'll start your seventh during that time. Yeah, during that time. Yeah, for wow. sure. You already wow. have the idea. Uh, I got I have a couple. You know, I have a couple. And like uh -huh. I was talking about before, those three pitches, well, I think one of them is is kind of in my wheelhouse and two of them are maybe a little outside the wheelhouse. Um, so I'll probably end up being that one that's in the wheelhouse. But they're, uh, yeah, they're they're coming, starting to come together in the idea stage. Nice. Do you ever start something before showing your editor an agent? Uh, or is it just not worth the time? It's kind of not worth the time, to be honest. Like, yeah, when I have a vote of confidence, you know, I then sit down and kind of do some free writing, but like before I do, mm -hmm. um, before I do outlining and before I, you know, think a lot, I, I, I just sort of sit down and free write. And I don't think a whole lot about point of view or tense. I'm just like, well, what feels good? What feels right? And yeah. um, that's usually 50 or so pages. And a lot of it is, you know, sort of aimless, but it is useful because you can kind of see what's what's going well. And then I decide on a point of view and I decide on a tense and stuff like that. I mean, 50 pages is not nothing. That's a lot more than I thought you were going to say. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. And again, when you're when you're kind of take the guardrails off a little and just let yourself go, 50 pages can happen can happen pretty quick, especially when I've got, you know, about seven or eight hours. Or yeah, seven or eight hours a day. Chunks to do of it. your day. Yeah, interesting. Do you ever do short stories? Yeah, it's I've got a couple that I've sort of been messing around with. The short story world is tough. It's tough to get short stories published anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's tough to get story collections mm -hmm. published anywhere. It's just sure. just a sort of a business fact that's difficult to do. Isn't and that uh, the line? Isn't that exactly the 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 line? And uh, and altogether now he's like, how yeah. can you publish a collection of short stories? Yeah, that's uh, one of those sort of rip from the headlines moments <laughs> yeah. in that book. Uh, it's yeah. true. It's just very difficult. So I have a couple of I have like four short stories that I'm happy with that I've done nothing with, and I think the idea is that maybe I'll get ten or twelve and then just like surprise my agent with it. Mm, with them yeah. and see what happens, you know, and uh, it'd be fun to, I would love to publish a short story collection uh, and I would make probably zero dollars for doing so, but it would be nice to just <laughs> to have them out in the world, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you send them out to other publications? Like, is that something you would be interested in? Yeah. I mean, there's only about three or four places that even really publish short stories anymore. It's very, there's just, it's hard to find a home for them, you know, and, yeah. and th that might, that might be an option. I think Probably the better, the easier option for me probably would just be collecting them in twelve or so, and then trying to publish, publish mm -hmm. them as a collection. Sure. What were you going to say, Ken? I was going to ask movies. Anything? I was any, going there too. Trying to go. I knew you were, but you know, <laughs> trying to get scripts done, or I think about writing a script, or have anything optioned, or anything like that. So I've never written a script of any kind. Um, 
beyond advertising commercials. I think that it would be fun to try. And my agent is like, oh, you should. And I'm always like, oh, maybe I should. And then I just never do, it seems, because I just am mm-hmm. so attracted to writing novels. All of my books, with the exception of one, have been optioned to some degree. Some of them have been optioned mul- multiple times. And nothing has come out of them, you know, mm-hmm. um, which happens, you know, because it's, it's easy to option a book, you know. Yeah. And it's like it's basically like I call dibs on this book. And then right. for six, 16 months, they kind of try to maybe make it happen. Then it doesn't. And then they're like, okay, whatever. You know, that's happened with, with a lot of my books. And The Charm City Rocks, my newest, is kind of in the process of being optioned right now, uh, which is which is exciting. So uh, so we'll see. Yeah. Worst case, you get a couple bucks for them sitting on it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's worse things in the world, right? I mean, I, feel, yeah. I haven't worked on that book in like two years. And if somebody gives me money <laughs> for something I did two years ago, it's like, hey, bring it on. I'll take it. Yeah, great. That's yeah, yeah, and that the, isn't that the goal? The, the I was what was it? Um, my family big American Idol fan, but somebody was like, uh, Lionel Richie would always be like, "That's a mailbox song," and he's like, "What does that mean?" And he's like, "Well, you write a song that's that good that every day, you know, now for the rest of your life, you just go to the mailbox, open it up, and there's your check." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just keep mailbox going. money. <laughs> And it's so lame now that I guess it's direct deposit money, which is well, just so that lame. doesn't seem just yeah, so lame. There's less no, exciting. No, there's no romance in that. We're going to stick with mailbox, <laughs> mailbox money. Yeah. I, uh, but I, I thought the same thing as I was reading Charm City Rocks. I was like, this is easily better than a lot of the rom coms being produced, you know, nowadays, or at least. And I would think, and we've we talked about this a little bit before on the show, but with so many more avenues to for original content and things like that, I wouldn't be surprised to see more opportunities for writers. Absolutely. I think that so movies right now, like feature films, are very difficult to get made if it's not some sort of tent pole, three picture kind mm, of yeah. sequel sort of situation that's going to make hundreds of millions of dollars. Those right. are tough to get made. Um, so but streaming television episodic is yeah. where it is where it's at for, for writers right now. And novels really uh, lend themselves to that. You know, it's something that can be expanded over the course of, you know, multiple seasons and threads that are maybe closed in a novel can be, you know, picked up again in characters that have minor roles in a novel. Yeah. Maybe they'll be a major character in, in a TV Episode. show and have, you know, yeah. have their own lives, you know. Your heavy use of music in the books, too, also lends itself to TV better. Absolutely. I wouldn't want to be in the person who works for that studio that has to get all the rights to those songs. But uh, <laughs> somebody yeah, else, that would be somebody else's heading. That's, fine. Yeah, that's somebody else's problem. But right. um, but you're so right. I mean, the show that I most recently kind of obsessed with is the show The Bear on FX. Which I'm I also, uh, the last person to watch that show. Everyone has told me to and I haven't yet. It's fantastic. You're going to love it. And yeah. they use music uh, a lot. Um, oh, okay. in very, very good ways. And there's a band that I ha- have a soft spot for, uh, Wilco from <laughs> Wilco mm-hmm. from Chicago. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. they pop up a good bit in that and, uh, mm-hmm. REM, REM does a good bit too. And, uh, yeah, so, um, you, you, it, that's a home run. You, you will love it. The, uh, uh, the musical, uh, part of it definitely sort of carries through, um, and that what's, uh, have you seen any good bands lately or what's, what's on your horizon for that? So I, because I have kids, I don't get to see concerts as much. And of course, COVID kind of wiped us out for concerts for a long time. Um, mm-hmm. I saw you 2 for the 23rd time oh my, Jesus. of my life in uh, <laughs> Vegas, uh, Vegas in back in October for their, their, their residency Sphere. in Vegas. I How was that? that? It was fantastic. It was yeah. really, really cool. And what I'm about to say is going to sound totally awesome. And you guys are going to be super jealous. Um, <laughs> I, I am a member of the U2 fan club and I have been for like 20 years. Okay. Mm. I'm like a, one of the founding sort of like, I've been a member of the club <laughs> as long as there was a club. Right. Right. Yeah. And so because of that, I get early access to tickets. So I'm essentially guaranteed like floor seats to any U2, uh, at least one show of any tour that I want to go to. And well, I'm so, not at, a- astronomical like resale values also yeah exactly i mean i just get them for you know face value and um nice. so my friend ryan and i who i grew up with were like right on the floor or like 25 feet away from you two and i've seen you two from 25 feet away many times that's like yeah. it's it's great but it was mm-hmm. weird to see them in this context because that entire structure is built to be seen from like 100 yards Way away. Back. Right. Yeah. And right. so I felt like I could have been at the 930 Club in DC, 25 feet away from, you know, <laughs> but there were people literally a skyscraper above me looking down on these, you know, U2 shaped ants. You know, it, right, it was, right. it was really wild. So I feel like 
it felt like a club show to me, but um, it was just this gigantic um, production. It was it was really fun. And um, one of the things that I've enjoyed most about having kids is seeing music from their perspective mm-hmm. and getting them to bonding with them over the stuff that they like. And a couple of years ago, like right coming right out of the pandemic when everything was starting to open again, my wife and I took our girls to see Dua, Dua Lipa down in uh-huh. D.C. Oh, yeah. my God, that was a blast. And seeing that was basically their first like real concert. Yeah. And yeah. Seeing them see that was fantastic i mean there that's was awesome back, backup dancers and you know outfit changes it was it oh was, yeah it was really wild we took um, our kids to see pink this past year yeah same thing yeah yeah and uh, uh, oh you saw the show too i didn't but i know you're talking about just uh, yeah. the what you're talking about just backup dancers oh my God. And, she was wild my son was he didn't want to go at first just because i don't know he's a punk and he just says he doesn't want right. to do something but then i got a video of him like just losing his mind and like singing along and throwing his hands up and stuff yeah, that's the thing about Pink in particular. You might not even realize you're a fan of Pink, but then she starts right. playing her hits. You're like, oh my God, I like oh, all these songs. I know every all song. of these songs. Yeah, every absolutely. song. Yeah. It's great. We took our kids to see, uh, well, so we were, <laughs> it's an interesting generational thing too. But uh, my daughter, for her first show, she wanted to see Shawn Mendes last summer or two two summers ago, two summers ago. Um, and so she didn't know we got her tickets. Surprise, we're going, hey, we're going to go down to uh, uh, DC to go see Shawn Mendes. And then he ends up, uh, basically canceling his tour. And I don't know that he's gone back out on tour yet for mental health reasons, you know, because he was just exhausted and having issues and stuff like that. And hey, God bless him. That's great. Yeah. I'm like, I was trying to explain to my wife, I'm like, could you picture Axel Rose being like, we're just going to stop touring for mental health. I just need some time, you know? Yeah. And and and, and, and by the way, the difference is- Maybe he just never explained it, right? They should have. They should have. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? They're probably, yeah. you know, yeah. a few hundred fans in Canada that would tell you they should have. Yeah. <laughs> Fast forward, we ended up uh, getting tickets to go see Ed Sheeran in D.C. So we got to see him uh, last summer, and that was their kind of first big concert. But the day of the show, uh, uh, Khalid was supposed to open for him, and Khalid ends up, or the day before, uh, he got into a car accident and could not open for the show. So they were supposed to have two openers. And so Ed Sheeran came out and opened for himself. Basically, wow. he came out with an, an acoustic guitar and a, and a guy playing piano and a, just a jeans and a T-shirt. Wow. And, and Jeez, did, a whole, did a whole set with just him and a guitar singing songs and like talking. And it was awesome. Like, <laughs> and, and hilarious too, because he kept talking about how he's like, the last time I opened for anybody uh, was the Rolling Stones. He's like, because when the Rolling Stones call you to uh, open a show, you say yes. Um, <laughs> he's like, but before that, He's like, I was just playing clubs in England and all that stuff. And I was constantly promoting like my CDs and my MySpace page. So he spent the rest of the MySpace. show being like, I'm Ed. I'm on MySpace. Go to MySpace.com slash Ed And that's me. He's like, yeah. Um, and then he came out and did the whole show. Did he open with yeah. acoustic versions of his own songs? Yeah, it was all. But yeah, exactly. It was all his own songs doing gotcha. like random like things through it. That's really cool. It was a really went... cool first experience for them too. Yeah, yeah. that's wild. Okay. It is funny though because my uh, my son, similar to Aaron's son, too cool for school, but he did not stop dancing the entire time. He has very much, and I, and I love that about him because when you meet yeah. him, like he, uh, one of our friends, when he was two years old, coined, he's like, he doesn't give a shit about shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even at that age, he kind of had that vibe about him. Yeah, but he, but he very much, at least for right now, is very much a dancer, a singer, like loves to buy in on those things, and then as soon as it's done, it is back to like just shut it down. That's, nice. that's that's pretty punk rock. I like that. Yeah. yeah. So you say it's harder to get out and see concerts now that you have kids. Mm-hmm. I, I totally understand that, but I would disagree on my, my end. And fortunately, Ken has been my uh, partner in crime for much of that. When he turned 40, I don't know, what, 26 years ago? That was, yeah, what was that? 83? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was 2017. 2016. Yes. Yeah. His big thing was uh, a 40 for 40. So he wanted to see 40 concerts that year. So, wow. Yeah. I, um, you know, as a friend, I had to encourage him. You know, I had to help out there. <laughs> but he could never say no to a concert that well, yeah, I wanted to go see. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That is impressive. That's a good Put one. it on the list. Yeah. There were, yeah, there's yep. some craziness in there. So I ended up doing it over two summers, basically. Yeah. Gotcha. But it, yeah, it was good. Good, good stories there. I, I saw who I see the killers on like a Friday night in Atlantic City and then drove back to go to Merriweather to see Dawes and Brandy Carlisle and somebody else. I can't remember who. 
and then drove back to the beach the next day, you know, so there was some, there was, there was some legwork put into that. Yeah. That was like a part-time job to see shows. I mean, that's, <laughs> it kind of was. That's pretty, especially <laughs> because concerts are, you know, not always obviously, but concerts are sort of Thursday through Sunday kind of concentrated, you know, at yep. least. Yep. So you have yeah. to, you have to do some work for sure. There was, a, there were a lot of late nights and, and things like that too. So yeah. my, my wife, God bless her. You know, she was very supportive. There were a couple. <laughs> yeah. There were a couple that that I was like, ooh, that was, might have been a bad call. I probably shouldn't have gone to that. <laughs> really, <laughs> but, push that. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so what? What are anybody you have on the horizon that you're going to see? We're going to see. Uh, we are going to see Taylor Swift in Europe. Oh, oh, oh shit! Okay. That was that was our big surprise for the kids for Christmas. Wow. And so is Paramore still opening for her? Because they started announcing a bunch of you know cancellations and dropouts and stuff recently. Oh, you know, I haven't followed that. I'm not sure. Yeah, so we're seeing her. So whoever opens for her. If it is them, I saw them at Red Rocks a bunch of years ago. And it was like one of the best concerts I've ever seen. Oh, cool. That well, girl is an absolute rock star. They're great. Yeah, she's yeah. got a great voice. Um, and we're also seeing the my girls are, they really like, obviously, Taylor Swift. But they yeah, right. um, they really like Olivia Rodrigo. And mm-hmm. so we're going to I love Olivia Rodrigo. <laughs> yeah, she's great. Those two albums are great. She's really they're awesome. Like, yeah. They're like straight through good albums, like push play. Yeah. You know, they're right. fantastic. So we're looking forward to that. We're going to Nashville uh, sometime in March, sometime in the spring, I think. Uh, we're going to see her. So we're we're excited about that. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's funny. You know, so at some point, you start leaning into that and sort of chasing your kids music. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think that for dads like us, I mean, music obsessed dads like us in particular, yeah. I think Taylor Swift has been great. Like, yeah. it's like a chance to bond with our kids and our daughters sure. over something that we, you know, collectively can enjoy together. So I think uh, I tip a tip of my cap to Taylor. Uh, for sure. I'm I'm definitely, a, definitely a fan. Yeah. Talented girl. Woman. Excuse me. We'll edit that out. Yeah, That's definitely. Right. I'll make it sound like you said it. <laughs> misogynist pig <laughs> you bastard bastard so uh um you know you're talking about midwestern vibes and uh fast-paced east coast world but with all of your musical influences thrown in and i love that you have really diverse musical influences i say really diverse but i just mean from diverse within aaron's within aaron's spectrum of things that he approves <laughs> you're very right. diverse <laughs> in that <laughs> In that very nice uh, no, just that you don't have, you know, you mentioned Wilco and there's a lot of dads who like Wilco who like nothing but that kind of dad rock right. music. Dad you know? rock, yeah. <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. that's true. Uh, I like that you throw everything else in, too. So, I mean, we touched on this before, but like your sensibilities and the lightness and kind of what moves through, like, does that carry over in everything else? I mean, is that what you intended to write? If you're going to go to a movie, is that what you want to see? Yeah, pretty much. I, I mean, I do enjoy, you know, watching a thriller or a horror movie or something. Those are those are fun sort of. But um, if I'm going to sit down and watch a movie, one a big influence on me just as writing in general is pretty much all of Alexander Payne's movies. Uh, yeah, he, sure. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen his newest one, Holdovers. Yeah, it's it is an Alexander Payne movie. He didn't write that one. It's a little bit of an anomaly for him because he usually writes and directs them, but he did not yeah. write this one. It, but it is very much his aesthetic writing wise, the script. Um, he's What's also your favorite from, one of his uh, sideways for sure. I think is just fantastic. Just this melancholy masterpiece. I love it so much. A friend of ours. Um, yeah. That is his ours, that hands is. down favorite movie. And we give him a lot of grief for it. He gets no quarter. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> just, <laughs> just endlessly at any given moment that that can come up uh, as a point to needle. That's hilarious. So, um, yeah, so I love comedies and I love the sort of melancholy kind of comedies, you know, mm-hmm. where there's, you know, kind of sadness and turmoil bubbling under uh, under the story where you're laughing a lot, but you know that there's sadness there. I think that is probably aesthetically just right down the middle for me, for sure. sure. Yeah, that's a hard tightrope to walk. It is because you can be kind of dour. You can seem kind of, you know, mm-hmm. a little, little dour and depressing. You know, I think that I, I have a, a comedic voice and I think that as a lot of my personality is based on trying to be funny uh, as a way of getting people to like me. So I think that was like <laughs> what I did when I was, you know, nine years old and I'm doing it now when I'm 47, you know, yeah. it's like trying to make people laugh. And while they're laughing, maybe they'll hear this other thing that I have to say about yeah. 
Mm -hmm. uh, how difficult it can be to unconditionally love children. You know what I'm saying? It's stuff like that that is woven into my books that is not funny, but it's presented in a sort of funny, um, funny package. Yeah, it's a good cover. Well, it's a a way in to like, it's a a, a path to get to where you want to be that's approachable, you know, in that way. Mm -hmm. Oh like yeah, think, in that sense. But I, I meant like personally, oh. it's a, it's a good way to cover up all the uh, hard stuff that you know you're mm. not uncomfortable with. But in your sense, you're talking about it's like uh, a sugar coating. Yeah, makes exactly. it easier to swallow. Yeah, the, the the heavier story you have in there. So I'm always impressed by anyone who can write. I don't know drama. You know these heavier, darker stories, but even bring in the lighter tone. It's hard because it is very character focused. Yeah, the 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 drama, like the hard, you know, the hardcore drama, like Schindler's List or something. I, oh. I'm just like, wow, can you imagine just diving into that and writing that over the course no. of a long time? I mean, it's just like that is a <laughs> lot, you know. Um, yeah. And how much got edited out of that? You know, how much was like, oh, this is, you know, all right, yeah. too much. Let's go. You know, that's yeah. that's the hard part going through all yeah. that, too. Exactly. I'll leave that to other types of writers. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the ones who can stand that and are out to win awards. Yeah, exactly. Have you thought about revisiting your characters like you were saying before about like a sequel or uh, something like that? Is there anybody, you know, I, I, I sense that, you know, certain times with writers, especially your Stephen King fans, you know, it's like there are characters that he likes a lot and he sticks with them and they come back, you know, and, and thread through his novels and things like that, because I think he just genuinely enjoys writing for that. Do you find that at all? Have you got, been attracted to coming back to any of your characters? Yeah, so... Stephen King does that. He revisits characters. Um, Richard Russo has done that. He's a hero of mine. I love mm-hmm. Richard Russo. A lot of writers have done it. Taylor Jenkins Reid has done it to great success. Um, she's mm-hmm. she's pretty fantastic too. And so I have done that a bit. Uh, I have not written a sequel or anything like that. But if you were to read my all five of my books start to finish, you would see characters pop in and oh, out. Oh, cool! And, That's awesome. Oh, nice. Yeah, and so I, like I really that. enjoyed doing that, especially the Baltimore novels. Basically, my last couple of books have been set in Baltimore or around Baltimore or Baltimoreans go to the beach sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, there have been, I have borrowed, you know, some characters and, and been referential. And I've tried to do it in non-obtrusive ways. So the idea that somebody is just going to pick up all five of my books and start on page one and go all the way through is sort mm-hmm. of unrealistic, right? So right. the idea that I don't want someone to feel like they're missing something if they don't read things in order or don't realize that this character popped in in book three and is now a pretty significant character in book five i don't i don't want anybody to be put off right. by that but there are there are definitely some um oh, that's great uh, some easter eggs yeah throughout ah that's neat as far as location are you more comfortable writing within your surroundings or are you ever looking elsewhere for whatever place that may be because location's a pretty significant part of your stories they are and i I have always liked the idea of being as specific as I can when I'm writing about Mm -hmm. anything, right? And what can be more specific than location, right? And so you set the characters in Baltimore. I've tended to just kind of write books set in where I'm living when I'm writing them. And that's, that's, that's been pretty well. If I got an idea for a character who lives in the Upper East Side of Manhattan or something, and I would have to figure that out and I'd have to do a lot of research. I have to go up there. I have to do a lot of Google searches. But, you know, my idea is for the last several novels, it fit nicely in about a four or five mile circle around my house, you know? And so I (laughs) just tended to just kind of write there and be happy with it and try to capture some of the nuances of Baltimore, which I really like. And the fact that I'm not from here, I think, gives me an interesting perspective on this city. Even if I'm writing about characters who were born here, I, I can kind of look at it a little as a little bit of an outsider, and I think that offers an interesting perspective. But uh, I really like Baltimore. I think it's an interesting city. It's an in-between city. It's not a big city, mm-hmm. but it's certainly not a small city. You know, it's kind of in-between, and um, I've just really enjoyed setting my last couple of books here. So I'm curious. Baltimore gets such a bad rap just for most people, mm-hmm. and it is a flourishing city. Like, there's a lot going on. There's a cool art scene here. There's a lot of music. There's, you know, restaurants all the mm-hmm. time. But what what's your take on the people here as an outsider writing about them how would you place it culturally you know it's interesting there's a lot of different aspects of baltimore there's like um there the schools here the high schools especially the private high schools mm-hmm. are very much a thing like when i was yeah. <laughs> people who don't know that i'm not from here they will just what where do you where did you go to high school and right. i'm like i didn't my thought they say where did you go to school and you probably you know 
give him some snooty college answer like a real bozo like, yeah exactly george and, mason uh, oh, wow yeah where's george mason is that a high school <laughs> on Falls road or <laughs> but um yeah it's uh no you're right and so i think in that respect to my wife and I, since we're not from here either of us I, I think that we have not intentionally but i think we have found ourselves kept maybe at arm's length from people we know who grew up here and are best friends with the people they were best friends with in third grade or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, I think that's definitely, definitely. A, alive here. Um, and that's not a good thing or a bad thing. I think it just sort of is, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. because it's a people where it's a place where a lot of people are from and stay, you know, and the Midwest is like that. Omaha is like that for sure. I mean, uh, people, you know, have, have grew up there and they're adults there and their kids go to the same grade school that they went to. And that's great. My time in DC was meeting a lot of people that weren't, you know, from there. Okay. Yeah, DC um, is more of like a transient city. Yeah, totally. People from everywhere. Feels very like people that are there just to kind of pass through or work their way out of, you know, and, and also way more sort of metropolitan, I would say, in a sense. You know, I remember oh, absolutely. I plenty of friends. I grew up in Annapolis, so I have plenty of friends that, you know, went to that and live there and come up and, you know, they come up to Baltimore and they're like, there's no place in DC where you're going to get a $5 pitcher of beer. Like it just doesn't exist. You know? And so <laughs> yeah. it's like, or and just be able to do that, and that's hanging out in Fells Point, you know, going going down there to the horse you rode in on and all that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, it, it's got a lot of it's got a lot of charm to a lot of personality. I think that people are, you know, they're friendly and very kind of straightforward in a way that I really like. Um, mm -hmm. you know, which which has been fun. So I, I've enjoyed writing about about Baltimoreans and pretending to kind of be one of them, even though I'm mm -hmm. not quite. You know, it's funny. Even okay. in go ahead. I was going to say there's definitely a lot of wealth in Baltimore. It's like old wealth, but there is a general sort of like blue collar vibe through everyone here. It's a consistent mm -hmm. thread from the people sitting on stoops to the people who own, you know, these multi million dollar horse farms. Yeah, yeah, I agree, which is which is interesting. And the horse farms were for they took me a while to get used to the fact that it anywhere in Baltimore or its surrounding areas, you'll drive past the grocery store and there's a horse farm. It's like they're everywhere. It's crazy. Uh -huh. And I've uh, I've had thing. those in a couple of my books. I've had characters just suddenly stumble upon a horse farm a couple of times. <laughs> it's like out by us, there's a like saddlery, like in a strip mall. <laughs> what that is, is very what? unique. Oh, that is very okay. unique to Baltimore. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, when I go to pick up my son from school, there's often moms who show up in like the tall boots. Not hunter boots, but more like riding boots or like chaps and stuff. Yep. Um, have you uh, I'm just going to go back to the music thing real quick. Too. I was just curious. Have you reached out to any musicians or any bands or anything like that that you yeah. would just for like, hey, when you use your song or use any of that stuff in your in in your books? Um, so I've been careful not to quote song lyrics in such a way that I need to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I've been kind of strategic about that because it is very difficult. And I found that out with my second book. I wanted to quote a Wilco song um, just specifically. Mm -hmm. And I, I went through the process of trying to do that. And it was very expensive and very difficult to do. Wild. The, uh, and, and it probably has to do with, I guess, the levels that you are at. And I would say that's probably like an advertising. You know, for us, coming from an ad world, it's always like, I want to do that. Well, what's it going to cost to actually license that? Can you know, do you have permission to do those things and all that? Whereas we interviewed Paul Tremblay and he was like, no, no, no. I use it as a vehicle for that. He's like, I just use this sort of to be able to meet my heroes. And so I reach out and he's like, a lot of them tend to be writers. He's like, so I just reach out sort of personal level and I'm like, hey, I really like this. I do this. This is my thing. I'm legit. I would like to use your quote. And so he's actually established sort of personal relationships with some of his sort of heroes in that way. That's really uh, cool. Well, I found when I was trying to get the Wilco lyrics for my second novel, it wasn't like I was calling up mm -hmm. Jeff Tweedy and being like, hey, right. man. So I reached out through the publishing house and they had questions that I just didn't have an answer for. It's like, well, how many books are going to be printed? I'm like, well, there are this many at first, but it could be more if it does well. Then there's e-sales, you know, whatever. Yeah. I, and it just became What's way the least more. expensive answer? Yeah, exactly. What do you <laughs> want me to say to you to have you say yes? But yes. um it became way more than it was worth worth yeah uh it just it wasn't something that was the, the obstacles were placed almost to make me give up i think you know right but, uh, mm. yeah. right yeah that's frustrating i mean it's the same way like you know from advertising anytime you want to use something really cool and interesting and do something then you have to jump through a thousand hoops but uh yeah we use the well we use the uh theme from welcome back cotter in a campaign 
you know, welcome back. And the, it was actually uh, – that was a little bit easier because it's obviously it's not somebody who's like current and, and, and you know, out, out there in the space. But the hoops you have to jump through just to have something like that in a silly little regional campaign. But it's the same thing. How much reach yeah. do you have and all that? I, I would say, and I would encourage them from nowadays, you know, like you can kind of get it, get to people, you know, if you, if you're persistent, you know, trying, that's, that's how Aaron books all our guests for our show. <laughs> persistent on Twitter. Yeah. yeah maybe I'll try persistent. that. Maybe Work just connections. working around, you know, working yeah. around the, uh, the apparatus is probably the way yeah. to go. Yeah. yeah. No worst case scenario. You I don't know, talk to someone cool. Right. Yeah. Or get right. a season to assist from somebody cool. And then you're like, Oh my God, check it out. Yeah, right. yeah, maybe they can this. sign it for you. Yeah. <laughs> Tweedy asked me to sign something. Yeah. <laughs> and his lawyers. Right. Anyway. So we touched on this a little bit. We always like to ask, you know, a little bit about your hometown, like where you came from. If you were to go back there, what is there to do? What would you emphasize and what would you promote there? But you bounced around a bit. So what would you yeah. call your hometown and like, where would you want to go spend a day? Wow. I have bounced around a bit. Um, I think that if I were to talk about Omaha, Nebraska right now, it would be me talking about Omaha, Nebraska in 2002 or, uh -huh. you know, or 2001 when I left and it probably wouldn't be quite accurate, you know, mm. and it I, it also I have, doesn't sound like that area has really influenced your writing or your style that much. Yeah, not much. You know, I think it probably formed certain elements of my personality, but I, I sort of moved, you know, and never kind of never went back, although I have nothing but lovely things to say. And I go back from time to time and I still have some great friends there. I don't have family there anymore, but I definitely have great friends there. But I, I definitely think of Baltimore as kind of not only where I live now, but where I'm from in like my adult sense you know being sure. an adult here i two kids here raised two kids here you know that kind of thing you've absorbed it a little more than you know where you were in the past yeah exactly and so i think just a day at fells point in fells point would be fantastic i mean there's mm -hmm. a record shop uh in charm city rocks is my most recent book and it is record tape uh, traders that's it's uh it's, <laughs> I mean, the sound, sound garden. Garden. i'm sorry <laughs> the yes. sound garden yeah so <laughs> i took the sound tape I took the Sound Garden and just changed the name because I thought Charm City Rock sounded like a you know yeah. a, a novel title, yeah. and it worked. And so I I changed nothing else. Like if you describing the book in the book, the descriptions is exactly like it's yep. just such a fantastic record shop, and it's just a great neighborhood with the cobblestone streets. And yeah, I think just spending a couple hours down there, you know, would would be just not a bad little Saturday. You know, there is yeah. plenty to do, and uh, even the newer stuff what is it the pendry that's mm -hmm. there now that used to be the old was it a fire station yeah i think it was like police a fire station. station i think it was police station that was what the it's a police station from the wire or no homicide from homicide that was I'm homicide sorry. that's right yeah yeah I, I can't remember what it was before that it might have been a police station but anyway they did an amazing job of renovating that and then just outside of it on the piers you know it's very approachable now Cool. Yeah, that that bar at the Pendry is fantastic. There are a lot of places oh, yeah. to drink. A lot of places to drink down in. Uh... <laughs> hmm. uh, say one of your buddies from Omaha comes to visit and has never been really on the East Coast. What are you going to take him out to do? He says he wants to do something different than Omaha. He really wants to experience it. So kick off during the day at the Sound Garden. Where are you going from there for the afternoon? Where are you going for dinner, drinks? I think uh, starting at the Sound Garden would be great, and I think from there we would do the journey. Two two of my characters do this journey in Trump City Rocks. Mm -hmm. They then walk to Camden Yards for an Orioles game, and nice. they kind of take the long route through Federal Hill. And I think it would be fun to walk through Federal Hill and route to Camden Yards, and maybe stop by maybe a place like Mother's or something in Federal Hill would be a lot of fun. And then uh, just head there. And uh, yeah, I think that, I mean, that is a great day. I it, On any given day, I think Camden, Camden Yards is probably my favorite place yeah. in America. Like, I just absolutely love it on, on game day in particular. Now that they're yep. a good team, there's yeah, a lot of people there. And it's just so much But energy. it's an impressive stadium. Oh, it is. It's beautiful. It's got such a great view of the city. And um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that is definitely where I would take, and I have actually, to be honest, I have, uh, you know, my friends have visited uh, from the Midwest, and it's like where we're going. It's like we're going to Camden Yards. That's where we're going. And uh, yeah, nice. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's a very good time. Hopefully, you drank somewhere better than pickles. 
Oh my goodness, that place. Yeah. Pickles is not pickles is wonderful. You get out among the people. Get off your freaking high horse. That's right. <laughs> Climb down from my ivory tower. Yes. You and your your it's college lovely. degree. <laughs> yeah. I always say that uh, you know, football is my my favorite single sport to watch. Like I'd rather watch a football game than a baseball game. But sure. baseball is my favorite sport because generally speaking, it's nice out. Generally speaking, I'm going to Camden Yards. Um, the Orioles have been hit or miss. Obviously, you should, I'm sure could say for the last 15 years, but they're good now. It's good. Um, but it's also every day, basically. So it's like the this great thing, love that you can always have, and it's always there for you essentially throughout the entire, you know, from spring to summer. Yeah, my wife, when my wife and I started dating, she just did not grow up with baseball fans. And she only had a kind of a casual um, understanding of baseball and how just the culture around it. And when we when we moved in together, she one day she said to me, wow, this really is on every day, isn't it? Because every day I would turn, I'm like, yeah, that's the beauty of it. There's 162 yep. of these. And then there's the playoff. You know, and she's like, oh, is that good? Is that she's a like, good I don't know if that's a positive. That doesn't seem like uh, is this a win okay. in our lives. Is this what we want to do every on a Tuesday night? But um, right. yeah, so that is, uh, I'm definitely a, a baseball guy. Like, I mean, I love watching football and I can go down to a Capitals game in DC and be perfect happy too. But but uh, baseball is definitely my my favorite sport. Very it's a cool. good part of town too. Have you been to the Visionary Arts Museum over there? I have not. I need to. I hear it's oh just my gosh, nice. yes. You should do yeah. Take the girls too. Take the girls. Yeah. It's super like it's kids so of fun. all ages, sort of friendly and just yeah, bizarro, weird stuff. I have friends who got married there. It's wonderful. Oh nice. Yeah, that's oh. a good that's a good spot for a wedding. Oh my god, it's fantastic and got cool like artsy stuff all around. Yeah, it's great. Well, we've kept you a long time. Should probably wrap up. Anything you want to throw out? Anything coming up you want to plug, talk about? No, I'm kind of in that wonderful um, dead time between books where I just get to go to my natural state of being a mole person and not ever <laughs> talking to people or, uh, you know, it's, that's kind of where I am right now. You know, I'm, I'm working on a new book. And if something were to happen with, um, you know, Charm City Rocks, the TV show, that would be fantastic. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, there it's in that stage now where, you know, anything could happen. And But it would be wonderful. It's um, you know, it, it'd be it'd be great for me, and uh, I think it'd be cool for the city too. Yeah, it would um, be great the, for the city not to have a show like Homicide or The Wire. Yeah. Or, right, <laughs> yeah. like, we yeah. love it. We just want to move it to Nebraska. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, you hey, sons of bitches, get out of my town. <laughs> the these these Hollywood executives. You know. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, I don't think I don't think it would set as well in Nebraska, but it's yeah. a very Baltimore book. Very cool. Well, good luck with that, man. It's very cool meeting you. Yeah, thank you. It was really you fun. Too. Absolutely. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks. Look forward to it. Take Same. care, Matt. See ya.